Welcome to the symposium. I'm Dr. Allison Hayward, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to the event and make sure that you know all the details and why this is happening. And this is just a very wordy disclosure slide that the um, Continuing Medical Education Accreditation Agency is making us display, but I have nothing to disclose. And I want to take a moment to recognize our co-sponsors for this event who kindly funded us to be able to be here today. That was a sustainability seed grant from the um, Office of Sustainability and Resiliency and the Climate Solutions Initiative at Brown University and also my employer, Brown Emergency Medicine, kicked in a little bit of support as well, and so I wanted to appreciate them at the same time. So I additionally wanted to thank the wonderful symposium organizing committee, um, mostly made up of various physician colleagues and also um, members of the medical school's eco group. Thank you so much. Couldn't have done this without you. So the reason why we wanted to organize this event, we saw a great opportunity when the sustainability seed grants were being announced, was that we really saw that there were so many people who are doing amazing work in the area of climate change and health, and we don't even know about each other in some cases, and we're all in the same small state, and, um, or even in the small region. Uh, where there's a lot going on, and we don't need to go far across the country to learn about interesting research and interesting interventions um, and find out more about climate change and health. We have experts right here, and I really felt that bringing together people locally and trying to make sure that we all meet each other and all can learn from each other was a really important thing. So um, thank you for joining me on this. Um, just a couple of reminders about the event. So right now, we're just in this room, but starting at 10 a.m., we do have lectures as well in the other lecture hall that's more towards that side of the building, uh, 170, and so you can check on the agenda on the website and see which one you'd like to attend, and the other ones will be recorded and should be available on YouTube later on the Brown University channel, so you won't miss anything. Um, also, uh, I hope you can stay for lunch because it's gonna be really wonderful and all vegan and vegetarian and um, looks very delicious, so just wanted to remind you that um, you can fill your water bottles here and that there's also a compost bin, which is like a really large yellow bin up against the wall out there. It doesn't have a sign on it. That's the compost bin. Um, so there's also two poster presentations today that I wanted to just bring your attention to because they may not have been so um, obvious in our promotional materials, but we have, um, one that will be starting at 12.45 and one at 1.30 p.m. And those posters are just gonna be displayed on the screen. Um, they're not printed posters in the 170 conference room. So if you're interested in learning more about these projects, there are some really fascinating work that um, have been done by local research teams um, and uh, on some both educational and also some more quantitative type of research work. Um, highly recommend stopping in, especially at the beginning or end of that poster session because the, um, the researcher who's presenting it will be there to answer any questions. Also be sure to get your CME credits. Um, I'm, I just need to make sure that I get your licensing information if you want to get credit for this. I paid a lot of money so that you can get credit for this, so please get credit um, and just fill out the evaluation at some point. Um, this code is also displayed out on the table there and I'm gonna send it to you afterwards too. Thank you very much, I hope you really enjoy today.
I almost forgot if anyone's missing a pair of glasses. These were left outside, so. so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So hi. And actually, I'm going to set a timer for myself so I don't rattle on too long. Um, hi, my name is Josh Wurzel, and I am a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow here at Brown. I also am honored to get to serve as the chair of the American Psychiatric Association's Committee on Climate Change and Mental Health, and I serve in a couple other capacities too. I sit on a think tank for um, psychiatry and their climate division, and I also sit on the um, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's resource group for their National Academy for Climate Change. So it's a real honor to get to talk with you about a topic that I'm very passionate about today and to share a brief overview of how climate change impacts mental health. Um, this is a standard disclosure slide that we're all supposed to show, but I'll also say that I personally don't have any disclosures. However, if you would like to change that and have your name on here, more than happy to do so. So I know that I don't need to convince any of you that climate change is happening, but I think a couple facts ground today's conversation. Um, currently, Earth's average temperature is one, probably close to 1.1 at this point, degrees Celsius warmer than kind of the pre-industrial benchmark of 1880. And we know that based on our carbon production that in all likelihood we're going to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius by mid-century and anywhere from 2 to 4 degrees Celsius warmer by the end of the century. Even in the past 24 years, we've had, um, I think, six of our hottest years on record. The last being last year is the hottest year on record. So climate change impacts health in myriad ways. Um, and these just list a few, including severe weather events, decreased water quality, spread of vector-borne illnesses, increased food insecurity and malnutrition, heat stress, asthma, allergies, and of course today we're going to talk about mental health. Um, we know that the impacts of climate change are inequitable. Um, communities of color and indigenous communities are often disproportionately impacted, both because of other intersecting social determinants of health, but also just um, their different relationships with nature. Poverty and those who have less resources in countries that are less resourced in general as well as in our own country often have fewer resources to recover from natural disasters and are in locations more disturbed by natural disasters. And then um, individuals with disabilities, mental and physical, um, again, because of intersecting or, uh, intersectionality with other social determinants of health. I didn't list this, but children are also a very vulnerable group. And as a child psychiatrist, I'm particularly interested in that. So when we think about the mental health consequences of climate change, I tend to group it into three buckets. We have direct effects, indirect effects, or kind of the ripples of climate change and temperature change, and psychological effects. Under direct effects, we'll talk about three learning objectives. One is describing the relationship of temperature uh, with the prevalence of mental health conditions. Two, we're going to describe how psychiatric patients are more prone to thermodysregulation at baseline. And then we're going to describe the role of several neurotransmitters, particularly serotonin, in the regulation of temperature. Under indirect effects, I'm going to just do a whirlwind overview of three examples of neuropsychiatric sequelae secondary to climate change. And then I'm going to finish with talking about the psychological effects reviewing traumatic and existential impacts of climate change on mental health. And a little bit about what we can do about it. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, or in this half an hour. You're going to do much more today than just this. Uh, so we'll start with looking at the relationship of temperature with the prevalence of mental health conditions. So um, the first thing we'll look at is heat waves. Heat waves are um, usually periods of two days or more of unseasonably warm weather, and the data are pretty robust that um, the uh, mental health outcomes seem to worsen during heat waves. These are um, two graphs from the United States, but Carlton and all have also published on a number of different international data sets. And we see a, a pretty linear relationship with the warmer the temperature, the uh, 
higher the rate of violent crime and suicide. I think the numbers are around four to six um, percent increases for every one degree Celsius increase during heat wave. Um, and we see that for violent suicides as well. A little bit of a lower rate, but the same linear relationship. When we look at warmer times of the year, we also see interesting patterns. Um, on the left, we have uh, suicide rates over a 10-year period in Italy, and um, on the x-axis we have different months. So in the box we have spring and summer, and you can see that there's uh, an increase in violent suicides that have been completed um, for men and women. When we look in the middle graph, we see uh, an Egyptian hospital study looking at hospitalizations for mania, also higher during the spring and summer. And on the right, we have a hospital in, um, or hospital study rather, uh, part of the VA, but in New Jersey, looking at hospitalizations for PTSD, higher rates during the spring and summer. It's not necessarily universal that um, temperature seems to correlate, or seasonality correlates with um, severity of symptoms. In this same Egyptian study, they found that actually there was a decrease in unipolar depression hospitalizations during the spring and summer. And when we look at this Vancouver hospital study, they found that for patients over a two-year period with bulimia nervosa, their binging and purging episodes seem to decrease during the spring and summer. So this is just to give you a, a sense that there seems to be patterns that are occurring with our patients. We don't quite understand exactly why, but um, perhaps some of the, the underlying neuroscience that I'll tell you about may be driving some of these patterns. So I'll tell you a little bit about how our psychiatric patients appear to be more prone to thermodysregulation. We've known for quite some time that patients with depression have difficulties with their temperature regulation. Going all the way back to 1890, Vigoro found that patients with depression don't sweat as much as healthy controls. That's since been shown in patients with bipolar disorder, depressed patients with panic disorder, and also patients who were actively suicidal. Interestingly, they've looked at um, the core body temperatures of patients with depression, and they tend to be on average higher than healthy controls, consistent again with their decreased ability to sweat. Patients with schizophrenia also seem to have difficulties with thermoregulation. This is a picture circa the early 1900s, um, where they used to treat patients with schizophrenia in these hydrotherapy uh, baths of either hot or cold water. The idea being that they were trying to help them with regulating their temperature. And that's because they identified that patients with schizophrenia have decreased temperatures at baseline. They have dyssynchrony in their circadian peaks in temperature, so during the times of day when temperatures usually fluctuate. And then they have impaired ability to cool when they're stressed with heat. This is likely due to um, changes in how they uh, regulate peripherally and centrally their neuropathways. When we look at just all-cause mortality and morbidity um, during heat waves, we see that um, patients with mental illness have increased risk. In fact, they have three times the risk of suffering heat wave-related mortality during heat waves. And that's further exacerbated if these patients are bedridden, have decreased ability to care for themselves, are socially isolated, and have other medical comorbidities that are cardiovascular and pulmonary. We know that Ironically, the medicines that we use to try to treat mental illness can also exacerbate thermoregulation. Sometimes it can make it worse, as I said, exacerbate, but also sometimes it can help. Um, patients with antidepressants, uh, on antidepressants, often experience diaphoresis or sweating. 10% of people on SSRIs and 14% on tricyclics. And this table on the right here shows you a range of other antidepressants and the incidence of sweating. We know that when patients take SSRIs or antidepressants uh, in overdose, that it can lead to the pathogenesis of serotonin syndrome or where people will have um, pathologically increased temperatures and hyperthermia. That has to do with what peripheral and central um, serotonin receptors are stimulated. And we also know that when patients with depression are treated with SSRIs and they have symptom remission, that actually their abilities to thermoregulate improve. So believe it or not, someone who had depression before will have a lower core body temperature after they've been treated and are less symptomatic. So SSRIs may actually be an example of where our medicines can help with thermoregulation, but a number of our other medicines may be deleterious. Antipsychotics, antihistamines, and anticholinergics all decrease heat elimination through parasympathetic modulation. And we know that um, this was a study conducted across France. They looked at um, the odds of being hospitalized if you were on different um, psychotropics, and they found that 
there were uh, six times the odds um, for patients who were on antipsychotics to be hospitalized for heat wave related issues, and then 4.6 for people on anticholinergics, likely due to decrease in sweat production. So hopefully this gives you a sense that um, our patients with mental illness may be more prone to the deleterious impacts of climate change and the uh, importance of understanding how the medicines we prescribe can exacerbate that or help that is uh, something to consider. So let's move on now just to take a tiny taste of some of the neuroscience of why we think our medicines are having these impacts and the neurotransmitters that we think are implicated in um, psychiatric illness may be also related to thermodysregulation. So this is, I'm, I'm not going to get into the weeds with this, but I, before I had delved into this literature, I hadn't really understood serotonin's um, central role in regulating temperature, but I'll walk you through. So skin uh, uh, thermosensitive proteins are actively telling us what the ambient temperature is. And this is all conducted up through the spinal cord, the spinal brachial pathway to the spinal brachial nucleus and the brainstem where it then synapses onto the dorsal raphe nucleus, which is the primary center for serotonin production in the brain. Now, that then synapses onto the hypothalamus, um, this area right here, which is our core thermostat, among many other functions in the body. And depending upon where the dorsal raphe nucleus stimulates the hypothalamus, we have different cascades of temperature regulation uh, physiology. So if you look here in this little kind of light red area, that's the preoptic area, that's associated with heat dissipation behavior, so things like vasodilation and panting, um, maybe panting less so in humans, but. Um, and then here we have in teal uh, the post -optic er posterior area, and that is um, involved with heat conservation, so things like shivering and vasoconstriction. And they've done some really elegant models, uh, or experiments rather, with animals where they've tried to understand how temperature regulates serotonin production. This is a study where they looked at two groups of rats. They had some at room temperature and some um, at 37 degrees Celsius. And they um, kept them there for two hours, and then they measured their core temperatures rectally. I'm glad I didn't have to do that. And um, the ones that were in red were the ones at the higher temperature. The blue were the ones at the cooler temperature. And what they did is they then um, harvested the rat's brains and looked at their dorsal raphe nuclei, which again, is that center for serotonin production in the brain. And they looked at the transcriptional activity of those neurons. So how active were the serotonin uh, neurons? And uh, that was measured through this marker CFOS on the y-axis. And basically what you can see is the higher the temperature, uh, the core temperature, and then obviously the ambient temperature as well, there's a linear relationship with serotonin production in the dorsal raphe nucleus. Now aside from serotonin, there are other neurotransmitters that are um, involved as well in thermoregulation. We know norepinephrine and epinephrine um, control vasoconstriction through alpha signaling and also stimulate brown fat for promoting thermogenesis. Acetylcholine stimulates the release of sweat. GABA is involved with um, tonic vasodilation and cooling. And glutamate is the primary neurotransmitter in the uh, spinal cord, the spinothalamic pathway, that will conduct information about peripheral heat from the skin the skin receptors. So again, very rapid fire overview, but I hope this gives you a sense that the neurotransmitters that are implicated in many of our psychiatric illnesses are fundamentally involved in thermoregulation. And you can imagine that when we give someone uh, a psychotropic that's altering these monoamines throughout the body, that it's going to impact their temperature regulation as well. So with that, we'll move on to the ripples uh, beyond just the direct impacts of heat. Um, when we burn fossil fuels, the carbon um, particulates that are put into the atmosphere, the impacts on changing CO2 for crop production and nutritional content, and even where um, different bugs that carry illnesses, zoonotic illnesses, live that have neuropsychiatric sequelae. So when we think about airborne pollutants, there's actually quite a robust literature that uh, they impact mental health pretty profoundly across the life cycle. Um, the particulates that are particularly implicated are the um, 2.5 micrometer um, size ones, and just to give you a sense of what that is, that's smaller than a red blood cell, and they percolate throughout the body. Also ozone, and these are created from forest fires as well as burning fossil fuels. 
Um, in utero, uh, we know that uh, children or fetuses that were exposed, um, their mothers were exposed, have growth restriction, preterm birth, and lower birth weight. Children have higher risk of developmental disorders, including reduced IQ, ASD, ADHD, and behavioral disorders. Adults um, have higher risk of affective disorders, so things like depression, suicide, bipolar disorder. And then um, lifetime exposure to these airborne pollutants is associated with higher rates of dementias, particularly Alzheimer's, where there's a, a threefold odds increase. When we think about crop production, um, often a lot of energy is put into arable land, having water to grow crops. But I think it's interesting looking at how even just the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can change nutritional content of food. And what they found is that actually increasing CO2 concentration decreases concentration of core macro and micronutrients, particularly protein, zinc, and iron. This was a, a nifty experiment where they had grown crops experimentally in atmosphere conditions predicted by 2050. And they looked at a bunch of different core food crops. And um, basically what they found was that there was a 4 to 13 percent reduction in these three nutrients in that atmosphere expected by 2050. Um, red is uh, protein, blue is iron, and, and gray is zinc. I know it's small. But um, for parts of the world that have fortified foods, probably not uh, an overwhelming concern. But most of the world doesn't have fortified food, and even small changes in nutritional content can have significant consequences. And we'll go over a couple of them briefly. So iron deficiency um, has been associated with many psychiatric sequelae. Oh no, what have I done? There we go. Um, uh, we know that uh, in deficiency, we have altered monoamine neurotransmitters and abnormal myelination. Um, it's associated with child and adolescent onset psychiatric disorders and cognitive um, developmental delays. And there have been some interesting case control studies that have looked at this. So they looked at um, a bunch of young people. This was a study conducted in Taiwan, as an example, with iron deficiency. And they looked at the um, incidence of uh, having mental illnesses when you had compared them between uh, low iron versus normal iron levels. And they found that um, children who had low iron had a higher odds of depression, bipolar disorder, autism, and developmental delays. Now, correlation versus causation is obviously always something that we have to consider. I'm sure there are other factors why they're iron deficient, but um, this goes along with the basic science of our understanding of how iron deficiency may impact mental health. Zinc deficiency similarly has been associated with particularly depression, pathophysiology. It's involved with endocrine, immune, and neuronal functions implicated in depression. When we look at animal models, we see that when we withhold zinc from them, they have more depressed behaviors. Honestly, I don't know exactly what that looks like in a little mouse, but I trust the scientists. Um, and that they can reverse those behaviors when they replete zinc. We also see in meta-analyses looking at case controls, of patients with depression versus those that are healthy um, comparators, that um, if you look at the zinc between those two groups, that actually zinc was lower in patients with depression by around two micromoles. And to put that number in context, because I don't often think about zinc, normal range is 13 to 23-ish micromoles per liter. So small changes in zinc have been associated with um, clinically significant symptom change in depression. And I think what was even more compelling is that there was an inverse linear relationship. So basically, the lower your zinc level, the higher your depression score. And then finally, when we think about vector-borne illnesses, um, we think about how climates and um, the various local, regional climates are going to change where different bugs can live. On the right here, I just have one example of Lyme disease. In 1996, the dark blue were the areas that were endemic. That has since grown in the 20-year period to include much more of the Northeast. The arthropods and ectotherms, um, sorry, arthropods are ectotherms that are dependent on external temperatures, and that's why, as climates warm, they can now live in other areas that they didn't before. And more importantly, or I guess I should say equally as important, is that the pathogens living inside them that cause the diseases are also temperature dependent. And so the disease burden within those arthropods is higher in warmer temperatures. The WHO has identified at least 11 vector-borne illnesses that are a major concern with climate change. And most of those cause encephalopathy and encephalitis that um, has uh, psychiatric sequelae, as well as um, individuals who are learning about this are more anxious, depressed, and even insect phobic. So hopefully this is just giving you the, the 
briefest look at how there are many, many ripples of putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and raising temperatures that impact mental health. So finally, I'm going to talk about psychological effects. Good, we're on time. So um, those are both traumatic from natural disasters as well as existential. And we'll talk a little bit about some of what we can do in particular to support people with existential distress. So there are three types of traumatic exposures. There are some that we might be kind of more intuitively familiar with, an acute trauma, think about like a Katrina that hits a town or a city and all of the aftermath of the PTSD, increased substance use, domestic violence that happens in the wake of a natural disaster like that. There are chronic natural disasters. Um, these can take many forms. They can be um, a city that's hit by repeated natural disasters. So actually St. Louis is, or not St. Louis, <laughs> uh, New Orleans is a great example of that where uh, there are usually repeated hurricanes that they experience can be um, like what we're seeing in the American West of uh, uh, aridity and uh, drought that we see year after year. Um, these are slow moving disasters and often compound some of the acute psychological traumas that I mentioned, um, but also deal with displacement and civil crisis even too in other parts of the world, especially now, but potentially here later. And then there are vicarious traumas. Vicarious traumas are when we're looking on our phones and social media and we're seeing what's happening in other parts of the world and we're thinking about how that could happen to us or what are our futures going to look like. And that's what I'm going to focus on today because I think that's really at the cusp of where research is at um, and where we know the least. So vicarious trauma in the context of climate change has been termed many different things. Eco-anxiety may be a term that you've heard. I tend to use climate distress, which is a broader term to encompass the range of emotions people feel, whether it's depression, anger, sadness, grief. Um, and there are other terms that have been bandied around too that we're really just coming to codify. So, so nostalgia, you might notice nostalgia in the root. It's mourning one's environment around one's home. So you're basically missing home because home doesn't look the same due to the changing natural world around you. Ecoparalysis is another term talking about the hopelessness and helplessness that many people feel in trying to prevent climate change. So you might say, okay, fine, worry about climate change. That's, that's a concern. Well, how common is it really? And it turns out it's quite common. Um, the Yale change, or sorry, Climate Change Communication Program has been doing some really robust work surveying Americans. They've found that 69% of Americans report being at least somewhat worried about climate change, and close to 30% are very worried. 49% think that they're going to be personally affected and harmed by climate change. This is even more pronounced in young people. This is a study that was conducted just a couple years ago in 10 countries across the world. Um, they looked at 10,000 young people ages 16 to 25. And what they found was that 84% said that they were at least moderately worried about climate change, and close to 60 said that they were very to extremely worried. So again, comparing that to uh, the general population in America, that's twice as many kids are um, extremely to very worried. 30 or 52% say that they think they're personally going to be harmed by climate change, and 45% say that it's going to impact their daily life and functioning. Or for, rather that it is currently affecting their daily life and functioning. One interesting just sub-analysis in that paper is they looked at the less resourced countries that were part of that cohort. And the young people in those countries were even more likely to say that it was impacting their daily life and functioning, 50 to 74%. So people want to talk about climate change and their distress about it. Now, this was another um, study conducted by Yale. They surveyed a number of Americans about their desire to talk about climate change in therapy. And on average, um, they found that 8% of individuals thought that this was something that they wanted to talk about. Going back to what I had mentioned about how a vulnerability is inequitable, they found some interesting uh, differences when they looked demographically. So when you looked by race, self-identified race, they found that compared to white respondents where only 5% had said they were interested, four times that percentage were interested if they were from Hispanic cultures or um, twice as much if they identified as black. And then when we even look by age, we see um, similar to what I said about uh, levels of climate distress in children versus adults. Um, if you look in the baby boomer generation, 4% of respondents were interested in talking compared to three times that rate in young people, Gen Zers and Millennials. So okay, what do we do? Uh, and this is 
but both uh, an emerging field in how we measure climate distress and then what we do about climate distress. There's some strategies for improving coping though. Problem fo focused coping is an idea of trying to engage people behaviorally in climate action to address their anxiety. We know that um, things, especially that are community oriented and not individual, seem to be more effective. So like being part of a recycling program or a tree planting uh, community effort. Emotion-focused coping is another one. Some of you may have seen the movie Don't Look Up, which is a parable for climate change. And um, on full display there, we see a lot of emotion-focused coping. This is where we're trying to okay, manipulate our emotions by mitigating them. Uh, sometimes this can be helpful if you're having such distortions that like the world is ending now or you know, I'm imminently at risk. We can try to talk people off the ledge, but just like we see in Don't Look Up, it can be used deleteriously. And then meaning-focused coping is probably the most powerful coping mechanism. And this has to do with drawing on a person's beliefs, their values, and their goals to foster positive affect or emotions toward the stress of climate change. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of Viktor Frankl, who um, had created logotherapy. He was a psychiatrist who survived the Holocaust and focused after that on trying to help people find meaning in the face of deep crisis. Other things like acceptance and commitment therapy are other approaches in psychiatry that we use to accept uh, a uh, less than ideal circumstance and then how do you work in that framework. Youth, as I mentioned, are particularly vulnerable. Um, so how do we talk to kids about climate change? A lot of parents are reporting that they feel uncomfortable or don't know how to deal with it. They sometimes report that they think their children are taking, blowing it out of proportion. So we want to provide opportunities to talk about climate change. We want to be honest and age appropriate when we're talking about it. Be curious about what they know and provide information that's on an age appropriate level. We want to make sure that we're providing support for their thoughts without being minimizing. And there are resources that are out there. This is one. Um, I mentioned the think tank that I'm a part of. The Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry um, wrote an evidence-based uh, book on helping youth with climate distress um, called Coco's Fire. It is available on Amazon. We don't get any money for it personally, but it all goes to research on climate change and mental health. But if we're going to try to help children with their climate distress, we need to be aware of our climate distress too. We're constantly being inundated by media about how the world is going to pot. And so we need to make sure that we are monitoring our media diet. We need to make sure that the goal is not to just kind of suppress or eliminate our negative feelings about climate change, but to acknowledge and validate them, to enhance our flexibility and resilience around climate change, and to also foster self-efficacy and engagement in climate action ourselves. One thing that can be very helpful is finding an effective community. This is a perfect example right here. But there are others, the Good Grief Network and climate cafes um, are for people who want to talk about their distress around climate change. They're professional organizations. I'm actually headed off to the um, American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting today um, where we have a caucus on climate change and mental health. I'm sure many of your other organizations have emerging groups as well. Um, there are other ones uh, specifically in psychiatry. The Climate Psychiatry Alliance is a nonprofit that I'm a part of. The Climate Psychology Alliance. I particularly recommend you look at their website. They have a lot of resources um, for helping support people with climate distress. Even a list of therapists who have expertise in helping people with climate distress. There's also some evidence that green space and being in nature is therapeutic. And so going outside and appreciating a beautiful day like today, but not skipping lecture after. Um, I think that our role as physicians is huge, um, both in our um, standing as some of the only scientists that our patients come into contact with, but also um, our clout uh, advocating on uh, different levels uh, in Congress and the state level. I'll talk about that momentarily. But we contribute ourselves greatly to climate change. I think this is going to be discussed later today. But briefly, the U.S. healthcare system produces 8 to 10 percent of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, 12 percent of acid rain, and 10 percent of smog. This comes from a variety of sources. The hospital system, keeping you know the lights on and the air conditioning is the largest. But the medicines we prescribe, the pharmaceutical sector produces 55 percent more than the whole automotive industry. Um, it's a very energy intensive process making medicine. And I think that as physicians, I'll speak as a psychiatrist in particular, we have a lot of knowledge about psychological resistance to doing things about climate change. And I think that as role models, we can do a lot to try to show society how we can reduce our footprints. 
the carbon footprint we have currently is actually larger than most countries in the world. So it would be profound if we could reduce our footprint. And organizations like the American Psychiatric Association are doing things to do that. We're committing ourselves to reducing our carbon footprint by 50% by 2030 for our annual meeting. And there are various strategies that we've been involved in in calculating how to do that. You can get involved in advocacy, like I mentioned. Um, this was a bill that I was really honored to get to present in front of Congress that is looking at trying to set aside money to build resilience programs on the community level for people dealing with natural disasters. Um, so hopefully uh, our local senators are in support, but uh, it's always, in our current political climate, a little tricky to deal with anything climate change related. Would love to talk with you all about that. I think that there's different strategies we've been talking and looking into in terms of how we just frame climate change and maybe talking about it as natural disasters is less anathema to some folks. So psychological effects, we've reviewed that there are um, both acute and chronic disasters that happen. I talked specifically about the vicarious trauma, the climate distress that many people feel. There are many individuals, 30% of adults, 60% of young people who are very too extremely worried about climate change, and there are some things that we can start to do about it. That's my timer, but I'm also at the end. Um, so I hope you take away a couple of things from today overall. Many psychiatric disorders are affected by climate change and ambient heat in particular. Psychiatric patients have difficulties thermoregulating at baseline. Our medicines we prescribe can help that, but also often probably exacerbate that. Neurotransmitters that are implicated in mental illness are involved with thermoregulation, and perhaps this may explain why we see this link between thermodysregulation in our patients and um, the mental illnesses that we're trying to treat. There are many indirect effects of climate change. We talked about three, including airborne pollutants, nutritional deficiencies, and zoonotic illnesses. There are many others that we didn't have time for. So, uh, climate change impacts psychological health through environmental traumas and existential dread, and many will be affected by this. There are steps we can take, especially as medical providers, to try to have an impact. This is a select bibliography. At the bottom of each slide, I had citations if you'd like to learn more. And I'd, just put this here in thanks to all the mentors and groups that I have learned from and been supported by. So thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And if there's anything in the chat, too, I'm happy to. Yes? episodic or, or can be short-lived heat waves. Is there any evidence basis or even anecdotally about medication adjustments? You know, there's a trade-off there because you don't want to interfere with the sort of efficacy of a regimen, but if something's, you know, if we have a weather forecast, it, are there opportunities to, to think about adjustment in response to environmental conditions? It's a great question. And I think that we don't have the evidence at this point to suggest that changing the medication regimen um, a, is going to prevent someone from having heat wave related issues, and also if it's going to be outweighed by an increase in psychological symptoms that a person might experience. What we are advising people, though, is to inform their patients about their risks and to try to make sure that they have access to cooling centers and other things um, to modify that risk. But it's an active area of research. Yes, in the back. I have the sense that, sense that uh, much of the psychiatric disorders that we're seeing is actually a reflection of brain damage. I think that honestly, um, neurology and psychiatry are just different sides of the same coin, and you know our distinction right now is just our level of understanding of how neuroscience works. Um, when we think of brain damage, we think of more structural damage versus perhaps the, the underlying uh, neurotransmitters and how they're regulated, functional connectivity and things like that. So I would say that um, it's hard for me to make a definitive statement about uh, whether you know, we're seeing the byproduct of neuronal damage or if it's just neuronal dysfunction. But uh, I think that they're probably, I, I can speak to the side that uh, from psychiatrically, neuronal dysfunction is happening with temperature. Sure. But no one, the, the unfortunate thing, you don't tell the parents that or the general population that. I think that should be kind of highlighted more.
Yeah, oh, for sure. Actually, I'll make a plug for my brother, Jeremy Wurzel, who is uh, someone else who might be a good person to talk to. He is um, also in psychiatry and has a lot more experience looking at uh, exposures um, like lead and other things, toxins, and how that affects mental health. Oh, so I'll, I'll work my way back. in here for children. Have you seen effects of stimulant medications on um, patients' health, particularly during heat waves? Um, That's a great question. Honestly, I don't think that there's as much in the literature about that. We do know that stimulants can change heart rate and blood pressure, and I would imagine that the autonomic instability that some children experience would be impacted by temperature. But I'm not familiar of papers that have looked at that. But great point. Um, each of us is most familiar with our own specialty and what pieces of it may have the greatest effect on carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. and like, as you mentioned, like prescribing <coughs> and like that. And I was just wondering, as a psychiatrist, what are the things that you might be doing in your practice that you think are kind of the top priority as far as that goes? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, of course. So basically, you know, each of us in our own little subdomains of medicine think about how we can impact our carbon footprint. And Allison was asking me what psychiatrists think uh, we can do to have the largest impact. Um, we don't have operating rooms. We're not producing um, some of the uh, chemicals that have been associated like in anesthesiology for increasing uh, uh, to changes in ozone and things like that in carbon. What we do, though, is... Um, have a lot of medications that have huge carbon footprints when they're manufactured. So things like, you know, and, and some of this is on a policy level too with what insurance companies dictate, but when you have a patient who you want to start on a medication and you give them a 30-day supply, but you have every intention of up titrating, um, perhaps you don't need to give them a full 30-day supply, but you give them a two-week supply. And, um, you know, the, you can think about the carbon density of each one of those pills is quite large. The um, annual meetings that we run uh, may seem like drops in the bucket, but when you look at what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is recommending, um, currently, I'll just give you a couple stats from the American Psychiatric Association because that's what I know, we are recommended by the IPCC to produce 1.4-ish or 1.2 to 1.6 metric tons of CO2 per person per year to reduce runaway models of global warming. When you calculate the average carbon footprint of travel to and from the annual meeting, we produce 1.4 metric tons of CO2 per person, so our annual quota. And um, there are many ways that we can reduce that carbon footprint. Um, we're currently looking into um, where we hold the meeting. Uh, we looked at our membership, and it seems like having a meeting in the Northeast reduces the footprint more. Um, use of carbon offsets, trying to think about use of hybrid meetings, things like that. So. Uh, Use of telemedicine, you know, we have, uh, thankfully in psychiatry, you really can do a lot via um, Zoom. And so I think that we've done some back of the envelope math that have looked at basically if I think 17% of all visits were made virtual, we would reduce the footprint by as much as holding our annual meeting virtually every year. So we think, we just we need to think creatively about it. Um, and uh, I think that we will have more effect efficacy in having each of our individual organizations change their behaviors if we coordinate. And psychiatry knows, oh, anesthesiology is doing X. And I, I think that we've faced resistance because no one wants to be the pioneer in reducing their carbon footprint. So I please reach out to me if you're interested or if you're connected with your organization that deals with its carbon footprint. Um, first, that was a fabulous lecture. Thanks for all you're doing. Um, I, in, in the coping, you identified three means of coping. Could you give me an example of how you might talk to somebody about the mean focus approach? That's a great question, yes. So, um, and in full disclosure, I have not treated many patients with climate distress. It's something that um, we're conducting a study right now. So I'm doing some research um, primarily looking at the impacts of heat on mental health outcomes in young people. But also we're interviewing a, a bunch of young individuals at Bradley Hospital um, who are in mental health treatment about their climate distress. So this is an emerging area of expertise, well, actually not even say expertise, of exposure for me. <laughs> um, but what I will say is um, trying to find what motivates people. So uh, 
sometimes the reason why I had a picture of a cross there is uh, different religious ideologies have this idea of being a steward of the environment, and so tapping into that, or um, different philosophical you know uh, schools of thought about you know our rules or our roles rather in helping the world and being the change we want to be. So I think it's trying to reframe how people think about climate change into something that they can feel like gives them purpose. Any other questions or anything on the, the chat? All right. Well, thank you so much for having me.